Happy Friday, everyone. Today is May 12th. This is episode 28 of our Doxis podcast. I'm Brady Volp, founder of the Volp Firm and Nimble This. We're happy to be here today. We've got John Downey with us, the Van Dam of Cable and CMTS of technical leader at Cisco Systems. John, fantastic to have you back with us today. How are you doing? Good. You know, down in Latin America, they were calling me Juan Van Dam. <laughs> Juan, Juan <laughs> Dam Van Dam. Perfect. Juan Perfect. Van we Dan. got it down. <laughs> uh, it's always good to be back. <laughs> yes, yes. Good to have you back. So, yeah, 28 episodes now. We are, I think, a couple of years we've been doing this. So, um, see, so your your dog's hanging out in the background there. Hopefully, he gets some entertainment as normal. Yeah, he's back there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so our our topic for today is R Phi, or also known as Remote Phi, what the R stands for. And I think, um, what do you have for us today on that? So I started putting together a presentation. You know, normally you and I just kind of go back and forth and you know ad lib, um, talk about whatever. And uh, you you said you know we could do it part three of our CMTS best practices, because we never finished. Uh, but instead, you know, let's focus on remote five and we'll go back to the CMTS again, I think, like a part three, maybe next month. Yeah, uh, we've been, we've been I getting don't think quite, we finish. Yeah, and, and we also have been getting quite a few questions on, you know, kind of what is R5. It's, there's been a lot of people talking about um, using remote five. So I think it's a relevant topic right now. And there's also, there's some different architectures. I mean, R5 is used in different ways, right? Correct, correct. And, you know, we use the term kind of generically, and one of the terms is DAA, Distributed Access Architecture. And um, Cisco's first implementation, you could say, was the modular CMTS, where we had the CMTS feed a uh, RF gateway, and it was just downstream. And then we said, you know, if we're going to do remote phi, Let's do upstream and downstream remotely. And now we had to implement not just downstream external file interface, DEPI, we had to implement another protocol called UEPI, upstream external file interface. But if you keep the downstream and upstream FI together, your timing is easier to control. So you can put that further out, maybe in the node, eventually maybe in a tap. Um, you can make a tap look like a node, basically. Uh, and then you do digital optics. So that's the stuff we're going to talk about. But then there was other technology that was being looked at called remote MacFi, Mac scheduling, and some of the complexity of the DOCSIS scheduler that's usually in the CMTS, and you put that with the Phi as well. But that adds a little bit more complexity, and Cisco made a conscious decision from the beginning, let's keep the complexity central and located in the CMTS core and put the Phi, something that is less complex, more simple, more simple, simpler, yeah, whatever it works. It's close <laughs> enough. Yeah, I, w w we don't have the grammar police on this show, so <laughs> is it Ron online? Ron would <laughs> oh, he he would definitely correct us. I'm quite sure on yeah. that. <laughs> that's not an acronym. That's initialism. No, yes. <laughs> he gets me on that one every time. So <laughs> if we keep it simple and put that technology, the five technology, out in the node, what if you wanted to upgrade iOS? If the node required iOS, you know, actual code upgrades, that would be difficult. You're talking thousands of nodes. But if the complexity is in the CMTS core and it's central, there's a lot less of those. So if the node is just physical layer and simple, there shouldn't really be any upgrades at all. Simple firmware download, maybe. Um, it's not a layer three device, it's a physical layer device. There will be some communications between a device, but it's not. A layer three device is not an I, you know, it's you don't have to worry about configuring it as another CMTS. It's not a remote CMTS, whereas some of our competitors might be looking at a distributed CMTS, like putting a CMTS on a pole. We've always thought about that as like, you're gonna get a technician to go work on a CMTS on a pole. You know, what RF tech is gonna climb a pole and plug in a console port? <laughs> with a laptop or, or, yeah, and know. do and do a configuration and upgrade and yeah, that, 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 yeah, does, and that does present some awkward problems well, why, why do especially you during maintenance windows I, I don't want to be the guy doing it during the maintenance window yeah we always talk about truck rolls being an expensive part so i can't see doing a truck roll to a remote <laughs> thing. yes yeah but i mean there's ways there's pros and cons to everything obviously 
Um, some people might say, well, if you do remote fly out to a node, what type of redundancy do you have? I'm like, what type of redundancy do you have to your node today? Probably none. Most nodes are small enough service group that you're really not doing redundancy to the node. You might do redundant power supplies in a node. You could do redundant fibers to the node, but you don't have redundant nodes probably. You yeah, could have that's... redundant lasers and transmitters, but most people don't. You know, right? I completely you can buy agree. buy insurance for pretty much anything. You know, you can buy insurance for anything, but you weigh the cost of that smaller service group. It's like, what's the probability of that thing going down? And if it does, how quickly can I get it back up? And how many people are really affected? Yep. And, and that's what you weigh. You know, you weigh all those things. So um, without further ado, let's go right into our slides because you know how we can just talk all day. I don't think anyone would say that about you, John. <laughs> <laughs> So here's our slides. Okay. Let's, uh, let's get them up here. There we go. We got the slides up. So the idea was, you know, why remote fly? You know, what is the hoopla? What's the big deal? Why would I even be looking at this? I have a CMTS. I have an architecture. I have an HFC plant. Why would I even bother upgrading and spending money or changing anything? If it ain't broke, why fix it? Uh, there are a lot of advantages of remote fly. As an RF guy, I brought this up. Oh, God, when I was at Secor Electronics 16, something, 20 years ago, and I said it would be cool if we could put the upstream chipset in the node itself to get rid of upstream laser clipping. Because I knew the upstream chip, Broadcom, Intel, whoever it was, had ingress cancellation. And once it's digital, the laser's just on off. You're not worried about overdriving the laser with the analog signal. So I said, man, that would be cool if we could do that. And it never happened, and it never happened. And then we went to downstream remote, meaning modular CMTS. And then we finally did the upstream with the downstream. And here's where I think we just took time to get processing and Moore's Law and all that to catch up so that we could get it cheaper and then get it deployed in the fiber nodes and then get the fiber node people on board with the, R the IP guys and the CMTS to be one group. You know, because it was always IP and RF guys fighting with each other. Whose job is it or who's going to take care of it? And are you stealing my work or whatever, you know? Come on, it always happens. <laughs> it still happens. But let's now get on you have video guys <laughs> and data guys kind of fighting on whose, whose product is it? Because now the CMTS is doing video as well. Right. Right? So you still have that kind of, you know, who's, where do you, where's the, the delineation of whose job is it? Uh, am I eliminating a job or whatever? Um, so here's where I go on a tangent. What the heck was I talking about? We're talking about, you know, <laughs> so this is Friday, and and we're actually live on the air, and we are talking about remote fi. <laughs> oh, we are, okay. It's not Friday the 13th, but it's close. <laughs> Friday the 12th. Um, so, so go to the next slide. I think we have, this was the original agenda. And that was just to talk about, you know. Yeah, we're skipping the, the agenda because you'll spend an hour on the yeah. agenda, John. I, true, I, I, true. I, I, so background-wise, because we've been talking about it already, this remote five device, RPD for short, uh, could be a shelf. It could be a module that goes into a fiber optic node. This is kind of assuming that all your signals on your plant to now, today are going to be digital. No more analog. Because uh, if you still have analog uh, video channels, you'd have to do some type of overlay. Uh, optical wavelength for your analog and an optical wavelength for the digital. Right. So, so, so this is digital, a big dif differentiator between our fog and and our fog, uh, remote fi. So I mean that that that's a clear right. differentiation between this. Uh, you know, our fog to me, uh, we, an easy way analogy or definition for me to give to people is our fog is just HFC with a much larger F and a very small C. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that it's makes still sense. a hybrid fiber coax, but the fiber goes all the way to the house, and the only coax is in the house. Right. So it's still HFC. It's still analog, but it's a node at the house. Yeah, and and, and that and with there. with our fog, that gives you the ability to transport all of your. If you still have analog channels, you can still transport those analog channels. And and I think the key point you're saying here with remote fi, you're not going to be able to transport those analog channels. You have to have an all digital. Right. Plant. Yeah, yeah. Like, what if you still had a legacy set-top box that has an out-of-band signaling? That's an analog signal. You know, how do you generate that? Well, the nice thing about the remote fi RPD and the spec, the cable lab spec, uh, is that we the remote fi device has to generate an out-of-band signal as well. 
So we kind of get around that, uh, you know, how do we support millions of old Motorola and SA set-top boxes? Right. So we can generate a signal from the remote fly device for that as well, which is kind of interesting. So, you know, the node is, is, is meant to be future-proof. So we're looking to go out to 1.218 gigahertz, which is part of DOCSIS 3.1 spec. Uh, the lower band edge obviously is dictated by your diplex filter, whether it's 42, 65, 85. Um, um, I'm thinking 85 for upstream, uh, which is, you know, the 85 upstream was supposed to be a 105 downstream, but because old set top boxes had a fixed control channel at 104, we actually pulled our diplex filter down to 102. So you might see an 85 102 split, not an 85 105. Sure. Uh, now, now, the other, the higher end was 204, 254. Now, 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 let me ask. I so so 1.218 gigahertz. That is a mandatory requirement for the DOCSIS 3.1 specification in a downstream, but there is a May requirement of 1.8 gigahertz in the mm-hmm. downstream. Is that mm-hmm. something that um, is is being considered for the remote five? Uh, Do you know? I think like we say. And and pun, pun intended, it's like a pipe dream. <laughs> yeah. You know, talking about going to such high frequencies, uh, we all know as RF guys that the spectrum gets very temperamental when you get higher frequencies. Well, and the attenuation, let's disregard just a high roll off attenuation. I'm yeah, just the attenuation is so <laughs> substantial at one point eight, and and most of the testing I've seen so far has only been to one point two gigahertz. I think any time we talk about high upstream and downstream frequencies, we're talking about less coax. Yes, very sure it runs. So it might be almost like fiber to the home, and and or maybe fiber to the no or to the tap, and the only coax might be the drop cable. Right, and and there it might make sense. Make yep. Okay, thank you. you. Know, less less coax basically. Um, even the two hundred four two fifty four split. There's talk about if I really get to a two hundred four upstream, I really have to limit my coax, and at that point. How much upstream does it really give me, even if I do DOCSIS 3.1? Should I look at FDX, the full duplex DOCSIS, where yeah. I actually change out my cable modem, and I have this thing called, uh, um, uh, what do they call it? It's a back feed. The, AGC? No, no, it's echo cancellation. That's the functionality of this new full FDX is echo cancellation, where the upstream if it backfeeds in a in an amplifier or the cable modem itself, it can cancel itself out. That's how you get the full duplex. Meaning, right. upstream could, t- could transmit at 500 megahertz, and downstream could receive at 500 megahertz without interfering with each other. Right. So there's a it's, that's why they call it full duplex and not half duplex. Yeah, because we we've covered before with a 204 megahertz return, uh, the, the attenuation is much more significant in the return, but also you have the temperature variation. So then you do you do right. need to consider potentially having AGCs in your return. It, it becomes a pretty significant problem. Yeah, yeah, so, I agree. So I back to R5. You're not gonna, <laughs> yeah, and, and R5 plus zero, right? Yep. More like remote remote by node plus zero amps. So you have limited coax. Um, and, and, then, and we all know that by doing remote phi, we have better MER readings because you're putting the phi chip right there. You don't have any analog optics which analog optics usually leads to lower MER. So if you have better MER, you have um, much better chance of running higher modulation schemes with DOCSIS 3.1. So they're kind of complementary. So, so do you have, I mean, you're saying better MER. Do you have any testing or do we, do we know what kind of better MER improvement we're going to get moving from analog optics, the optics we were using today with like DFB lasers to a digital optics? I mean, from my own preliminary testing, me and Ron Rag did some testing, even on the last generation of downstream chip, upstream chip, we could get a 50 dB downstream MER and a 40 dB uh, upstream MER. I mean, that's pretty significant. So that's talking right at the node. And because your node basically is your CMTS, because that's where the RF right. comes out. And you eliminate laser clipping, which Correct. which can be pretty significant when you're adding, when we start to look at doing 85 or you know even much more significant 204 megahertz returns with a lot more traffic loading correct correct and then uh also when you go digital optics you can go much longer distance i mean basically digital optics one zero all and off all and off so your optics can be regenerated uh you could go from a switch to another switch to another switch a router to a router um 
in theory, you could go, you know, across the United States. Now, yeah, so in, in reality, there might be some timing issues that we have to look into. But uh, and that's one of the things I wanted to talk about today. Yeah. And so, so right now with analog optics and the DOCSIS specification, we're at limited to about 100 miles, correct? Correct. And even in DOCSIS 3.0, was it 3.0 or 3.1? DOCSIS 3.1, they might have backported 3.0. They dropped it to 50 miles. Why yeah. they did that, I don't know. Maybe just to make it simpler for the vendors to, to do testing. Uh, but I still have customers out there that have a CMTS and a cable modem more than 50 miles apart. Yeah. The, the timing requirements are much tighter in DOCSIS 3.1. I don't know if that's why they dropped it. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, probably. And then the other one, one was licensing. So from Cisco's side, we're like, we will just do the licensing on the CMTS core and the remote fine node, even though the remote fine node or remote fine shelf is putting out the RF, there's no licensing on that device. So that device is kept cheap. It's easy, uh, easy to implement, deploy, and not worry about being char double charged for licensing, like a license on a CMTS and a license on an RPD. And this is all open RPD, so it could be a CMTS core from Cisco and an ARIS node with a remote fi device. So I really like the cheap and easy. That you put those two words together for me, and I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> so let's keep moving. On. Let's keep moving along. Um, this was also meant, it's meant to generate multiple downstream signals that you might carry today. Like you might need CW carriers for uh, ATC pilots and your amplifiers, maybe for leakage, leakage equipment. Maybe you need two tones because you're still out there doing the old rough balancing somehow or whatever. The only thing it's not going to generate would be sweep signals. But I would contend that if you're doing full spectrum anyway, because you have DOCSIS 3.1, a lot of digital channels. You have the new DOCSIS 3.0 modems out in the field that have full bandwidth capture. You basically have at your disposal a sweepless sweep. You can yeah. basically look at any of those modems in the field and see your downstream frequency versus amplitude uh, characteristic. So it's like a downstream sweep. Yeah, I mean, so so what we're seeing just everywhere is the the number of full band capture modems and full band capture are DOCSIS three modems or DOCSIS three one modems that have the ability to see all of the RF signals going into subscribers' homes is is proliferating yeah. so significantly that gives you such visibility to endpoints, not just you know sweeping at an amp, but you can see all signals going in every home, and most systems are going all digital. So now. You know, all digital means those qualms are flat across the top. And if you have OFDM, that's flat. You you have the ability from the head end to the home to basically sweep your plant using those, you basically using the qualm signals and all the, you know, all the signals in your plant. So doing that sweepless sweep with like a PNM server and the full band capture modems becomes pretty easy to do without any equipment or any techs in the field to be able to do that. And the other thing I, I, I'm looking at is even if I'm not generating signal, say, above 860 megahertz, the CMTS has so much, well, the newer generation has so much capacity, I could turn on more channels and not activate them with DOCSIS, just kind of turn on the RF. And now I just generated signal in the head end or from the remote fine device or wherever so that I can fill out that spectrum and then my full bandwidth capture at the modem, I could see basically a sweep of sweep all the way to for to the entire thing, out to maybe even 1.2 gigahertz if I wanted to. Do you understand? Like I want to generate signals that I'm actually not paying for. Yep. Because I'm not really turning on DOCSIS signaling in those RF channels, but I'll turn on the RF channels just so I can use them as test signals. Yep, absolutely. And and we do see operators that are doing that. Uh, e even when they're deploying DOCSIS 3.1, they'll turn on a DOCSIS 3.1 or even a simula simulated DOCSIS 3.1 carrier and see what it looks like before they act start deploying DOCSIS 3.1. Agreed. And, and on the upstream side, uh, these are the chipsets are meant to be you know future proof as well because once I put the physical layer equipment out there, I don't want to have to change it at all. So I want to make sure I can support at least eight single carrier qualms, ATDMA 6.4 megahertz wide channels, and two OFDMA blocks. Those DOCSIS 3.1 OFDMA blocks are 96 megahertz a piece. Now, you probably don't have spectrum to support all that, but you might say, well, from five to 85 megahertz, I might want to do two smaller OFDMA blocks interleaved with ATDMA 
four ATDMA blocks. And eventually I might want to get to what they call TNFDMA, which is time and frequency division, multiple access, where you're sharing the spectrum, where a 3-1 modem can burst, and then when it's not bursting, a 2-0 or 3-0 modem could burst in the same spectrum uh, with ATDMA. Right, right. So Good. The, so the physical, physical wise, the hardware will be there to support uh, the complete 3-0, 2-0, 1-0, 3-1, everything. Okay. Very good. So that's kind of the, the background of what the remote fly device is supposed to provide. Pretty much everything you do today in a head end, except for analog. If you're still doing analog, you have to have some type of overlay. All right, next slide. So here was looking at different deployments where today you might just be doing a CMTS and your RF is being analog optics. So you have rack space, you have cost, you have analog optics. Uh, you have fiber doing maybe dense wavelength division multiplexing to your fiber node and then RF out to the house. We're moving that into a distributed access architecture, DAA. Right. So, so what we're showing today, this is just basically your traditional HFC plan, CMTS to a fiber node. Um, just and, it, and you might have standard. limited fiber. Yeah. You might have limited fiber, so you're doing two wavelengths, maybe 1550 on the downstream and 1310 on the upstream. Okay. Who knows? So now, now what we're showing is is a, a again a CMTS, but this is the, what we're calling the distributed access architecture DAA. Which, which by the way, I want to comment um, uh, at, at the Anga show that's going to be in the beginning of June. I know you know in addition to Doxus three one, there's going to be a couple of uh, papers. I'm I'm on two panels uh, that are specifically focused on DAA. So I think it's a very relevant. Uh, uh, topic to, to explain this um, on how this works. Yeah, so here we're just showing that now we're coming out with digital optics, and that could be a 10 gigi link or. And that comes right out of the CMTS, the 10 gig yeah. link. Yep. So it's it's digital coming right out of the CMTS. Maybe you're going to a switch or a router, so it could be and layer two or layer three. So you see, so you you have Ethernet switch there. When when you say Ethernet switch, are these like just standard Ethernet switches? Yeah, yeah. So um, um, nothing special, um, off the shelf, and basically you're just trying to take maybe an aggregate, and it could be 10 gig e, but you want to blast it out. It's almost like RF splitting, right? You're you're saying let's take one input and then split it out to multiple gig e links. It could be one gig e links, could be multiple 10 gig e links, and I think I have a feeling everyone's going to do 10 gig e optics. But maybe each fiber node is only going to access two gig of it. So, so, so the you, the the um, the C cap or the you know the CMTS feed, feeds an Ethernet switch via ten gigabit um, uh, port, and mm -hmm. then that switch, that Ethernet switch, is capable of feeding multiple R RFI nodes. Is is that how this Correct. concept works? Correct, because you might say, well, you know, when I look at my capacity planning, each fiber node is feeding 500 customers. I only expect about two gig of capacity to feed that service area. So maybe five RFI nodes are sharing this one 10 gig link. So I could have the one 10 gig link from the CMTS feeding the switch, and the switch is feeding five links. So this seems like it gives a lot of flexibility in the head end to do different things and quickly cable things around, and um, that that's what surprised me about and why I ask is that you know this is just a standard uh, Ethernet switch. I mean, obviously a 10 gig Ethernet switch is not going to be uh, uh, something that you pick up at at, a, at, a, at your local <laughs> store, yeah. but um, it, it's still very impressive how that can how that operates. Yeah, and, and then what if you go to the next? Next uh, uh, option, where you actually up it to 100 gigi link, you got to make sure the switch will support 100 gigi input, right? Yep. So that could be more expense, or by the time you implement that, maybe the price comes down, maybe a year or two. Uh, but you might want to come in, because I'm trying to limit the number of fibers, right? Instead of 10, 10 gigi fibers going in, which I have limited ports in the switch, if I can come in with one 100 gigi port and then come out with 10 10 gigi ports because i up the capacity of each node or maybe i have a remote five shelf that needs more capacity um i want to limit the number of ports i need on the switch i want to limit the number of fibers i have strung up in my head end um 
So that's that's the goal is you don't want to say, all right, I took my fly out in the field, but now you just forced me to buy more Ethernet switches. Right. So you're limiting rack space in the head end, but now you're actually creating more rack space for switches. Right. So there's a lot of flexibility with what you're doing here. Yes. And then the very last option you'll see I pop up, I said, you could also take this a step further and say, what if I just need to have more RF connectors in the head end? Meaning my CMTS is good for a certain amount of ports, but I need more ports because I did some node splitting. So I could do service group expansion in the head end with a remote fi. So if you go to the next slide, I go through a lot of minutia here and, and a lot of wording, but if you go to the, the diagram at the very bottom, I'm trying to show that I have a CMTS that can service a certain amount of nodes, but what if you do node splits? If you do node splits, you have more RF connectors. You don't want to combine RF because now you combine noise. What if you could take that CMTS, swap out a couple RF physical cards, physical interface cards, we call them RF picks, put in a digital pick, and then just rack and stack remote fly shelves that have more RF connectors. So instead of putting another CMTS in, which provides, you know, or, you know requires more rack space, more powering, more redundancy, more HVAC, more cost. Um, why don't I just allow that one CMTS with all this processing to maybe drive a remote fi shelf, and now I just extend the number of RF ports I have by just rack and stacking more shelves on top of each other. So the CMTS, yeah, I mean, so the CMTS is just becoming like a CPU. I mean, it's just processing and scheduling stuff, and all yes. everything else is getting pushed out further and further into the plant. The RF ports are pushed further and further out into the plant. Correct. And, and, and this last example was I didn't even actually push it out into the plant. I just came up with a expansion idea for maybe someone's existing uh, architecture, which so is I wouldn't even call. You're calling the R R Fi shelf is that R Fi shelf that's just going to have R F connectors on it and it's going to be digitally connected to the C M T S or C Cap, right? Right. right. Yeah, what, I'm trying to create uh, more service groups to because maybe I did node splits and I don't want to have to put another C M T S in. And I know the C M T S I have has plenty of processing power to drive more service groups. I just need more R F connectors. Or how do I get more R F connectors? Well, the RFI shelf digitally connected to a digital pick on the CMTS. So when does the CMTS just get re be replaced by a computer or a virtual <laughs> server or <laughs> virtualized? And that's, really, that's the next. <laughs> it's funny. It's like we haven't even gotten to this point yet. Now we're already talking about virtual CMTS, and, and we're even it's calling it cloud CMTS, it, virtual CMTS or cloud CMTS, whatever you want to call it. The CMTS, once there's no RF ports on it, it's not really a CMTS anymore. It could be a router with code. Yeah, you just need to buy so, these RFI shelves, and if they're really cheap and easy, I, I just want one of those. Yeah, and then then it's this it's this, the file layer will just be talking to uh, software and scheduling that's in a server somewhere. Yeah, this is so cool, so cool yeah. how this is coming together and changing changing the architectures completely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we all. Uh, held back for a long time because our video was our, our bread and butter. It was the, 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 the lion's share of everything. Now data seems to be, you know, the, where all the money comes from, our cash cow. Absolutely. Absolutely. Video is in the IP. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. So for the, we call it CIN, SIN, the Converged Interconnect Network. And that's the network between a CMTS core and a remote fi device. That's going to utilize DEPI and UEPI for protocol, downstream external fly interface, upstream external fly interface. So that protocol and is going between the core and the remote fi. And that could be a layer two network, or it could be a layer three network. The layer two network is just with switches, but in a, in a metro ethernet, it might be later, it's probably most likely layer three. Uh, we still require timing. Now, in our original modular CMTS, we had the uh, required DTI server from Symmetricom, and it was kind of a pain because it was a sort of proprietary. It was part of the spec, but it was proprietary and not many people carried it. Uh, the timing for this solution is based on IEEE 1588, so it is a well-known timing spec, and I don't have to buy a proprietary timing server because most of the routers 
that are in customers' head ends today or hub sites already have this type of timing embedded. So you can just tag on to that router and that timing and use it as a master. So that master timing could be coming from an existing switch or an existing router. Uh, and then I just tie into that timing. Sure. So let's go to the next slide. It talks about layer three topology. Well, I, I actually, I want to talk just a moment about um, and describe the slide you have up right now for anyone who's listening to the audio only on this. You have a, you have a CCAP and that's attached to a couple of switches. And then we're talking about the layer two topology. The next box over we have, um, uh, you know, we're connected to some more switches. And then finally we go to the RFI nodes which those then are connected to the cable modems, set-top boxes, other devices that would be in the home. And you show optionally that our DHCP server, TFTP server, time of day server could be between the CCAP and the RFI nodes, right? Correct. Um, so, I, I mean, traditionally our CCAP is always sort of the router that the, the cable modems and set-top boxes talk to our back office provisioning. What, what's the benefit of, of moving that in between the CCAP and, and the RFI nodes, the, what we call that optional place where we put our provisioning equipment? Well, maybe if you have a CMTS that's uh, hooked into a Metro Ethernet uh, ring, in that ring you're probably going to have multiple CMTSs. Um, by putting the DHCP anywhere in that ring, it has access to any of the CMTSs. It's it's um, maybe provisioning all the CMTSs. Like I had someone else say, well, what about the RPDs? They are doing DHCP as well. Would you put them in the same uh, IP bundle as the modems? But then again, when I look at my entire network, my remote fine nodes could number in the thousands. Easily, right? right? Fiber nodes themselves would be three, four thousand. So I might want them in their own scope, uh, and maybe I have a provisioning server just for the remote fine nodes, and then I have a separate provisioning server or scope just for the modems, you know, and the and the, the CPE behind the modems. Yeah, so I could see how it could also help with um, you. You could increase the number of your provisioning servers. It, it could increase the time that they can uh, communicate with the the Doxis devices, and and also in, increase high availability. Because that's what I was thinking as well. You know, yep. uh, if one goes down, maybe you have something as a backup as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, makes a lot of sense. So uh, I did. You know, the next slide, it just goes into layer three, which basically you're saying in that CIN, the converged interconnect network, you now have routers. So it's not just uh, layer two switches, but it's layer three routers. Right. Um, and it really, nothing really changing at this point. Um, yeah, but the only thing- Putting the routers yeah. in there makes a lot of sense because now you don't have all that traffic um, flowing directly to the CMTS. All the load is not directly on the CMTS. Uh, the traffic's being directed appropriately. And now it makes it even more easy to, to take that CMTS and turn it into a virtual machine or a computer. Especially when you talk about DHCP and things being broadcast. Yep. Because in a layer two network, broadcast will go everywhere. Yes. Whereas in a layer three network, it's only going to where it's being routed or, you know, properly routed. Yes. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. So, you know, looking at some of the benefits, we talked about some of the benefits, but by doing the remote fi, and I'm just going to kind of read these off real quick. Uh, people can read on their own, but like you said, some people are just listening in on this. Uh, you have hub site consolidation. So you could basically turn a hub site into a, uh, a digital, it could be a hub site on, on a pole now. It doesn't even have to be a hub site. We've had customers say, you know, it cost me more money for real estate. And if I can actually get rid of that hub site altogether, because it was just uh, an optical, hub site, meaning going in and out optical. Uh, what if I could just put it on a pole? I wouldn't even need a hub site, you know, an actual uh, uh, building. Um, you have higher bit rate for Doctors 3.1 because you have better MER ratings. You have longer reach because it's digital optics, not analog optics. Uh, you have Ethernet to the node now. Uh, you could share the, the network for commercial and residential, not just residential. You have fiber becomes full service IP network. Lower power per service group in the hub, more service groups for wavelength, more wavelengths, lower plant plant maintenance costs, lower optics costs, 10 gig. Um, 
you know, the digital optics is in a small SFP. Uh, SFP, shared form factor pluggable. I think that's what it stands for. But um, that's that's not like the analog lasers and transmitters that have their own little chassis. You know, you're talking about the digital optics being on a small SFP. Simple fiber design, replace RF combining with switching. Uh, that one's kind of a big one, and I really do have a slide on the RF combining stuff later in, in so, the slides. And, and the SF SFPs are on... They're on the CMTS, they're on the switches, and they're in the remote PHY, right? Correct. So Correct. that means, you know, the, the optics go bad, you pull the SFP out, throw it away, put in a new SFP, and you yeah. replace your I mean, optics, not, you can also... Not, yeah, and they're not free, obviously, <laughs> but <laughs> small form factor, it's a, special, it's a universal specification. You can buy the SFP for long reach or short reach. So if you do that one example I had where you're doing service group expansion in the head end, you would just do multi-mode fiber because you're doing short reach, maybe 10 feet. And you yep. would do a cheaper SFP for a short reach uh, just because you're only going on a short jumper. Now, if you're going 80 kilometers, you could buy an 80 kilometer SFP that has more digital or optics and power coming out. So it can go the 80 kilometers. You know, and then you can go to your switch or maybe you do a 20 kilometer because you're going to a switch into another switch into another switch. Yeah, but I mean, anyone who's who's gone through the repair process with a DFB analog return path transmitter, they know you have two options: you can you can send it out to a repair house, or you can just replace the module and buy new. I, I mean, it's not like just swap pulling out an SFP and putting in a new SFP. It's it's a bit and, more and, complicated. And, and if you're going uh, DWM, DWDM route, uh, you can buy the SFPs on an ITU grid. Right, ITU yep. 22, 23, 20, whatever the ITU grade is. It's yeah, all based on fifteen fifty, right? I think there's a lot more options when it, when you get into digital optics. There's so many more options because it's it's much more proliferated in the telecom market. That's used everywhere. It's used in head ends for switching. That <laughs> there's a lot more options with SFPs for yeah. digital. And the more people using it, the prices come down more, right? Exactly. Exactly. So. I think that's fantastic. So, so. You know, the, the next slide, we just kind of compare the node to the shelf. Uh, and we just, and some of the things are really uh, replicated. We already talked about some of this stuff. Um, as far as the node, uh, I'm just trying to think anything different that we already didn't talk about. Higher bit rate, higher reach. scaling. Yeah. yeah. So we talked about that. On the shelf side, you consolidate small hubs. Uh, I could foresee uh, the shelf being a great fit for MDUs and also hospitality. The like MDU you might I have an thought of. I, I really like that concept because, I, I mean, a lot of people struggle with MDUs. They get really small um, CMTSs, mm -hmm. but you have all the management with that small CMTS. You have to exactly. configure it. You have to have provisioning for it. Whereas if you could just run a digital fiber to that MDU and feed it off of your existing CMTS and provisioning system, with a shelf, that's awesome. That's really going to save yeah. you time and money. And yeah, I mean, instead of, instead of yeah, instead of a CMTS pizza box, if you will, yep. uh, you basically are just doing a physical layer of shelf, or it could be a node in the basement of the MDU for that. For all I care, right? It doesn't really matter. Uh, but maybe a shelf makes more sense because you could plug it right in. Whereas a node, you might have to come up with ninety or sixty volt quasi square wave powering or something like that. Whereas with a shelf, you just plug it in, uh, and you can rack and stack it. Uh, and then you just come out with RF ports feeding your risers into the MDU. And I say the same thing for hospitality because you could have uh, an integrator come in and say, you know what, Atlanta has a Hilton Garden Inn. It has a Homewood Suites. It has a, a Hilton. It has a uh, Hilton Grand Vacations, whatever. But maybe I could be an integrator for all those different hotels. So I have a centrally located CMTS, and I just do a remote fly shelf to each one of those hotels. Each one fed by fiber. This is kind of, and, and this is almost like uh, what what was done with C-Doxis, where yep. they were feeding those with, uh, I think, EPON, and uh, the MDUs were all terminated with a C-Doxis device that converted uh, the EPON into Doxis, but this is much more standards-based, so very right. nice. C-Doxis was just China Doxis, because in China, that's it's all in Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they wanted a remote fi device, and we actually came up with that. And it was supported with the UBR 10K and the 3G60 line card. And uh, it actually worked out pretty well. So we said, you know, 
let's take that a step further and actually go through the standards process with cable labs. And that's when they came out with this distributed access architecture. And, and uh, what was the other one? MHV modular head end version two, right? MHV version architecture or whatever it was called. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. But, and, and all of this starts getting me closer to virtualization, which you brought up, right? The more we put the physical layer chipsets out in the field, and the CMTS just becomes a processing engine. Do we really need a CMTS anymore? It becomes yeah. a server that just does processing. You mm -hmm. know, has it all software driven. Cool. So, as far as power and space, you know, the space is kind of obvious. I mean, if you have less CMTSs because all the RF ports are out in the field, uh, less CMTSs means less power, means less less HVAC, less rack space, less cost. I mean, you could say there's less rack space because less CMTSs, but now I need more Ethernet switches. So there will be a slight trade-off there. But if you're doing video in the CMTS, you have less qualm generation from external modulators because you got rid of all the video qualms. They're now being generated from the CMTS. So there's a lot of stuff that we, and that, that was the whole premise behind CCAP, right? Converged, mm -hmm. um, converged cable access platform, yep. CCAP. And most people use the term CCAP just to mean video and docs is in the same <laughs> chassis. They use it very generically. I still prefer but, CMTS, but yeah, CCAP. Because <laughs> <laughs> everyone's like, oh, I'm doing CCAP, and then you find out they're not doing any video anyway. No, yeah. You know, they're still doing video on their regular analog stuff. It could be digital as well, but they're not doing any video in the CMTS, which, but the CMTS can do it. So, so what do you uh, think is the, the like percentage power savings that, that we're going to get when you're, when you're doing so a comparison? We did, we did our own little comparison on a RF board, um, and it was about 390 watts. And then we swapped out the RF generating board for um, the regular line card, but without the PHY modules embedded in it. Mm -hmm. And then we had to put a digital pick on the backside so because it was digital physical card now instead of RF. And because that digital physical interface card has SFPs in it, the SFPs draw power. Uh, we, so we add them together. So we went from 390 watts for the regular RF card to about 168. So less than half. Now, That's significant. Yeah, it is significant for the line card itself. So we're expecting, you know, after it's all said and done, maybe a 33% drop in total power if you convert to digital. Um, it's not going to be a 50% because you still have the supervisors and the fans and everything else sure, in there. Sure. Uh, but your line card wise, you're dropping more than 50%. And, and that's just per line card. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So that's, uh, that's surprising. I, I am. I mean, I, I, my background is RF, but so I do have an appreciation for what RF, you know, how much power RF takes. You know, I think we always think, well, RF power put into a coax cable is not very significant, but it does take a lot of RF power to do all the up conversion and down conversion that that occurs in that RF line card. And you're and, doing full spectrum lineup, <laughs> multiple multiple <laughs> ports, right? Multiple ports. Yeah, all the way up to and past the gig, all the way up to now 1.2 gig. We're going so hell. Uh, hell, so we go back power. 10 years. We go back 10 years and look at Wavecom up converters that did one channel. Yes. Like how much wattage was needed for one qualm? Yeah. Yeah. And you'd have a whole rack of those, and there'd be tons of heat coming off of those things. Oh, so. oh hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my last bullet point I, I noted, I said, and because I, I play the devil's advocate, because people will say, oh, yeah, that's fine and great. You're taking the RF out, so the power's dropping. But wait a minute, you're putting the RF somewhere. Yes. You're putting the RF out in the field. So isn't that making the nodes go up? So I wrote down, you know, I'm seeing that. There are energy efficiencies being created in the nodes themselves as well. And I saw our GS7000, even with the remote Fi module plugged in, uh, less than 160 watts. So, I mean, that's pretty low for, you know, these nodes are pretty big. Uh, it still has all the amplification in the node. And in the lid is the remote Fi module and the optics and all that. Uh, but the total node itself, less than 160 watts. Yeah, I mean, so we do have to power those nodes still that are out in the field. Yep. We're going to pay for that power, but at least we don't have to pay for the air conditioning on those nodes. <laughs> <laughs> Mother Nature is going to do that for us. Yeah, good point. <laughs> good point. <laughs> so, all right, that's, that's very cool. And then as far as power of uh, digital and IP, you know, I this is my 
my pet peeve is RF splitting combining. So the first diagram was just showing the RF downstream and upstream going to your analog optics. But if you start doing node splits, now you have to put in more CMTSs because you now you have more optical receivers, more optical transmitters, more RF connectors. Yeah, so more so RF connectors means more CMTS ports. Yeah. Yeah. So that's you pay the price already for the node split. We know that's expensive. It's time consuming. But then in the head end, you have to add optics. You have to add more CMTSs is, is, or you know cards, whatever. If you if you're out as you're saying, so that is you you pay for it on both ends, uh, on the yeah. outside plant and in the head end or hub site. So so now you've added and, and another drawing. Go ahead. So so my last drawing was saying you know with a digital link, what's cool about this is in RF you can't combine and split because RF overlaps RF, right? You can't just combine two RF links together at the same upstream frequency and think they're going to survive. Uh, on the digital, you can combine a lot of digital links into a faster aggregate link. So you could come out with one fiber, one wavelength that could be 100 gigabit per second and split it out or combine it in multiple one gigi links or 10 gigi links. And yeah, all so your RF is out in the field. So you yeah, don't yeah, worry yeah. about RF ports. They're all out in the field. Yeah, and, and you're basically saying this is done with the technology of switches, right? You're, you're taking your digital link and you're splitting it through switches. Yeah. Whereas if you had, if you took the RF, the digital switch out and said, let's use an RF splitter combiner, it doesn't have the you same lose effect. power. You lose, <laughs> you lose RF power every time you split it. You, your power yeah. gets cut in half. And the RF overlaps and interferes. Right. <laughs> right? Oh yeah. Yeah. You have RF <laughs> collisions or you have problems yeah. one way or another. The digital switch is smart. You split, yeah. you, you, you go into a switch, you split that, you're not losing power, you're not it's, having it's, collisions, it's the all, switch is managing It's all that. split and combined based on time, right? You're just going a faster, yep. faster link. Yeah, so this, this, that, that's a nice concept, a nice, and, and also going back to the original slide where I said, really, this is just a switch. Um, yeah. So much, a switch is so much better than an RF splitter. So, I mean, if you're an RF guy thinking about this, it may not click initially, but, um, if you if you've seen a switch in a head end and you see all the cat5 connectors coming out of the switch You realize, you know, those cat5 connectors you could have 24 cat5 connectors coming out of the switch They're not losing 3 dB it each but imagine a 24 port switch or 24 port RF splitter <laughs> You're gonna have a ton of loss <laughs> well, It's really by 32 to the fifth power is 32 ports, right? And then that means you're splitting it five times. Five times three dB is 15, but it's really three and a half. So at least 18 dB a loss. Yeah, it's significant loss. And that's that's yeah. the beauty between our doing splitting things in RF versus splitting things digitally. Uh, it's just not a problem digitally. So it, yeah. it's so much right. more elegant to work to do things in a digital world is much more elegant than doing it in the RF world. And and I say this as an RF engineer. I, I agree. I mean, because I'm the same way, right? We're both really start out as layer one guys, yeah. <laughs> physical. Layer. You know, I would take this a step further and, and you could look at, and you and I talked about this, you could buy insurance for pretty much anything. You always have to look at your architecture and say, all right, what happens if, what happens if this device goes down? What type of redundancy do I have? High availability uh, or just availability in general. So then the question comes up is what about the switch? Do I need a redundant switch? If I need a redundant switch, then I have to have redundant links. So there are, will be lots of architectures that are thrown out there, I think, that will say, all right, here's your options. You could have uh, redundant optics. You could have redundant switches. But now you have to have uh, digital links and ports, enough ports to connect, interconnect. Um, and I think that will come down to people just weighing the costs and benefits. You know, what happens if, because now if I'm going into one digital switch with a 100 gig E port, and that switch goes down, I lost potentially, could be 20 RPDs, right? Maybe, maybe more. Yeah, but but we have that technology with things like load balancers and stuff like that. Can we use that technology with with RFI, with what you know what we're talking about now, where we have switches? Can can we use yeah, that to yeah. give us high availability? Yeah, and I think that's what what will happen is people will look at that and say, well. All right, let's see, what do I do if a switch goes down? Well, let's wire it up this way with this type of architecture. Uh, it's gonna require maybe another smaller switch in between to be the go-between between two switches or something to that nature. 
which will drive up some of the rack space or maybe some of the cost. But you're always, like I said, going to weigh the cost versus benefit of and the probability of something going down. And if that thing goes down, are all my eggs in that one basket? Yeah, but, but but it's really cool that we have the capabilities of doing that with this technology moving forward. Because, I mean, how, it's really really difficult to figure out. Okay, how do we wire up redundancy for, say, our forward path transmitters or our return path transmitters today? It's not quite as easy to do that. Uh, yeah. Or or say we have a forward path. Say we have a a, a um an eight way splitter going to our forward path transmitters. How do we make that redundant today? Yeah, well, well, you don't <laughs> expect a splitter to go bad because there's no uh, no active device in it, right? Yeah, I mean, um, your connectors can go bad. Your there are things yeah, that can yeah. go bad. Yeah, obviously. Yes. You might even say, you know, if a if the digital switch is in a manned office or head end, how quickly can I change it out? Yeah, yeah. Some people weigh that option and say, you know what, it's not worth it. I'm going to keep a digital switch sitting on the shelf to back up, manually back up 100 switches, and I'll just replace it when I need it, manually. Saturday because if you do redundancy, yeah, if you do redundancy for all your switches, you might have to do like a, a five plus one redundancy. So now you have one redundant switch for every five active switches, which drives up your cost. Whereas if it's a manned operation that it's 24 seven, you might say, you know, I have a switch on the shelf. I can change this out in a matter of five minutes or whatever. I, you know, it always comes down to you just weighing the cost, cost benefit. Yep, absolutely. All right, let's keep, we're almost done, I think. Ah. All right, so this one was some real life testing we did between my location in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, which is Raleigh dorm. Uh, Cisco has a campus here in Raleigh dorm. And we have another campus, which was the old SA Scientific Atlanta campus in Lawrenceville, Georgia, outside Atlanta. So we hooked up a CBR8 in RTP, so in Raleigh dorm. And we hooked up one line card with RF to some Doxus 3.1 modems. And then we hooked up another line card with a digital pick to our Cisco network connected all the way down to Lawrenceville, uh, uh, Georgia, to a remote FI node in Georgia and a DOCSIS 3.0 modem. And then we hooked up a traffic generator. We hooked up some timing in one of the switches via an ASR 903, I believe it was. And we did um, some on the downstream or for the, the remote FI, we did four single carry upstream qualms, so four 6.4 megahertz 64 qualm upstreams four channel option bonding, and we did 32 single carrier qualms on the downstream. So what so was your time. split? What Or did you? Just a, uh, it was an 85-102 split. Okay. But on the on the uh, upstream, we just did four upstream channels, so it didn't really matter. So basically, we were within 42 megahertz upstream. Okay. And it was a DOCSIS 3.0 modem. I'm not sure if that 3.0 modem was even specified for 85. So how you know, did you, you get have the, to, you know, when you buy three O modems, you don't know if you have an eighty-five or forty-two. Most people buy it with a forty-two. Right. How, how did you get a digital link from from Raleigh, where you're at, all the way down to to uh, the Cisco campus here in Lawrenceville, which is ten it miles was, away from where like I'm at? Teeth. What's that? It was like pulling teeth. I mean, <laughs> we we obviously connect between Cisco's facilities, uh, Boxborough, Richardson, Texas. Lawrenceville, uh, San Jose. So it's and a Cisco it's link through, that you have uh, going through. Yeah, but it's not. But it's Cisco. Maybe just like any MSO would be tied to their other facilities via um, who's the big carriers out there? Layer uh, three. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, layer three. Uh, SQL on oh, no, SQL or uh, whoever the big carriers are. So yeah. we had to work with Cisco corporate to find <laughs> out how to get access to that network and get some uh, dedicated traffic because we didn't have a dedicated link. Right. And that was one of the problems is we don't have a dedicated link. We had to figure out how many hops does it really take to get down there? Like how many licks does it take? That's to exactly what I was saying. We're like one, two, three, four, five. It wasn't just three. It turned out to be 12 hops. Yeah, <laughs> it was 12 hops to get down. I mean, we were going through 12 switches and we had no control over was a switch router doing store forward FIFO first in first out. We had no control over the delay in each one of those devices. 
So go to the next slide. And this kind of showed uh, the architecture we were looking at. Uh, the top one was RTP and the, the switch, the CMTS, the, um, the, the local RPD. But then we also went to Lawrenceville, and that's where we went to the Cisco corporate network. Uh, and it turned out to be 12 hops. It turned out to be routers and switches. And it turned out to be a lot more delay than we thought. And it turned out to be uh, they limited us to 500 megabit per second link. So we couldn't do DOCSIS 3.0 line rate at 1.2 gigabit per second or anything like that. We Actually, knew we were limited to 500 megabits per second. We yeah, said, yeah. you know what? Fine, just give me something. <laughs> so, so we started with that limitation and then go to the next slide. Um, so this was, a small, and I just threw up a Google map of, you know, as the crow flies between RTP or RDU airport and Lawrenceville, you know, a Hartfield. Uh, it's about 350 miles, which is 565 kilometers. It's probably actually that, longer than this. Because <laughs> <laughs> that fiber probably doesn't run straight as the plane correct, flies. Correct. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, even if it was 565, if you do the math on fiber, that would be about three milliseconds of delay, which is not very much. But when we did the actual testing, it was averaging 18 milliseconds of delay. Still not so bad. The fiber, but so the fiber was only three. And all the delay from all those routers and switches is what was really yeah, killing us yeah. as far as delay went. So go to the next one. This was basically our results uh, or some of our test data. Uh, we were looking at round trip delay. We did our testing with UDP first because knowing user data grant protocol, you could do a downstream test and not have to worry about upstream acknowledgments. Right. So we did UDP just to baseline it. And we were able to hit very good speeds with UDP. And then we went into the TCP testing. Um, we also knew that because this is remote phi and it's uh, encapsulated, we had some extra overheads. So we had to make sure our MTU was about 4, 1428. We couldn't really do a 1500 byte Ethernet frame because of the extra encapsulation. We'd put it over 1518, put it over 1522 docs, whatever, make it look like a jumbo grant, had to fragment it, stuff like that. So we had to manipulate our MTU size a little bit just to kind of optimize it. And we used the DOCSIS 3.1 cable modem, but it was really only doing DOCSIS 3.0 mode anyway. Uh, go to the next slide. Now, is there, is there you get better performance out of a DOCSIS 3.1 cable modem than a DOCSIS 3.0 cable modem, even no. when it's, it's operating in 3.0 mode? No, operate basically the okay. same. Just that's what you had for testing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there was no difference. So for UDP testing, we were able to easily get 400 meg on the downstream and 70 meg on the upstream. And that basically was our, our link limit. Right, and, and that was fine. I mean, 400 mega downstream, seven, 70 mega downstream. Now remember, we're going a long way, 600, 600 kilometers away. <laughs> so we're almost getting line rate from a 3.0 modem being that far away. That's awesome. That's fantastic. And, and there's no reason why we can't go even farther than that. Now the question comes up: What about TCP? So then we looked at map advance and we looked at TCP transfer and you no know, TCP windowing kind of ramps up at the beginning and it kind of negotiates. And then the upstream acknowledgements get concatenated, but a lot of times the cable modem will do act suppression and that can affect the TCP windowing. So we were manipulating our map advance and our timing to find out like how much did the TCP kind of do a sawtooth reaction? Because when you look at TCP speeds, you'll see it ramp up. And then come down and ramp up and then come down. So you get like a sawtooth type of reaction of speed for TCP. Mm -hmm. And a TCP is basically what you're doing when you're, say, downloading files, doing maybe video, uh, adaptive bitrate video, over the top video. That's TCP based. Yeah. I mean, actually, most of what we do on the internet is TCP, except if okay. we're doing like voice traffic or even what we're doing right now with this Hangout is, is mostly UDP. Everything else is pretty much TCP. So I, I think TCP is a more fair test. So, so what we ended up with was we, we uh, found that if we set up our map advance properly to have proper delay, if you will, um, the TCP might not be a ramp up as quickly, but it was more stable. Now, we were still getting uh, easily uh, say each TCP session could have been 100 or 70 to 100 megabits per second. So it's not like the TCP was being limited to 10 meg on the downstream because the upstream was slow. Right. And that's what the big concern was is if you have a real long distance between the cable modem and the CMTS, 
and the modem has to make a request to send the acknowledgement, how quickly does that get turned around and then the modem actually send the acknowledgement? Because that acknowledgement will dictate the speed of the downstream TCP. Well, it turns out when the downstream and upstream are in the RPD itself, even though the upstream acknowledge or request gets only sent all the way back to the CMTS, the SIN, the CIN or the digital link can mm -hmm. be sort of self calibrated out. Kind of like the CMTS and the RPD know that distance. So you can turn around that request a lot quicker. Right. And what I found also is with DOCSIS 3.0 modems, because they're doing upstream bonding, they do this thing called CCF, continuous concatenation fragmentation. So those modems are less likely to have issues than a 2.0 modem. I suspect, and we have to do a little bit more testing with a 2.0 modem, because you could have a 3.0 modem that actually registers in 2.0 mode on the upstream. Maybe mm -hmm. because of power yeah. level issues. Maybe you can't do four channel upstream bonding and the modem registers in 2.0 mode in the upstream. Well, that modem in a remote phi environment with long distance, his upstream speed might be limited to say two or three megabit per second. Yeah, significantly less. Yeah. So it's, it's like in partial mode then. Is that correct? It's not 2.0 mode, it's just partial mode. But then you might say, well, wait a minute. If he can do one ATDMA upstream, that's 27 meg. Why can't he get at least 10 meg? Well, now because the 2.0 modem is doing single channel request, grant, request, grant, and that long distance, he might only get, say, two or three meg on the upstream. Right. But I would contend that, one, the modem's not doing what he's supposed to do, and getting two meg on the upstream from a 2.0 modem is probably more than enough. I mean, you really should have the modems doing 3.0 mode properly in a remote fire environment to get you know 10 meg speed on the upstream or 20 meg on the upstream. So, so what was your TCP transfer rate when things were operating correctly? It was, so you can get a single modem to get almost line rate, meaning the full speed, but normally you have to do multiple sessions. Like the TCP session itself, you might only get 50 to 100 megabit per second. I was seeing maybe 70 megabit per second. So I could take a 3.0 or 3.1 modem doing 3.0 uh, downstream. Uh, 32 channels and if I said do five TCP sessions so individual sessions so basically your modem is feeding five PCs mm -hmm. each PC could do 70 megabits per second yeah so I mean that's but, exactly but I, I what we and saw. I couldn't get one PC to do it right because of TCP yeah that, that's similar to what we saw like when we would do uh, try to get the maximum out of a single modem, even with DOCSIS 3.0, we would have to do multiple sessions in order to get high speed tests out of a modem. So I, I think Correct. that's pretty consistent with TCP Correct. testing. So yeah. yeah and that's... if you think about what most people are doing, they want more aggregate speed to their house because in their house they have multiple sessions going on. Well, you have multiple users. That That's exactly. why you want more speed. <laughs> but many users that are trying to stream Netflix or do different yeah. things at the same time, it's, it's it's a very common scenario. Yep. Okay. Was there was there uh, more summary and observations, or was that the? Conclusion? I think so. I think I think that was a summary of the timing, and then the conclusion was basically you know this everything it's working today. Oh, I wanted to point out this one is because the RPD is out in the field, and there's going to be hundreds of these RPDs. This is going to have to have a lot better automation, and this is where we talk about SDN the software defined networks where we envision someone with a smartphone with an application on their smartphone, maybe with a QR reader, actually scanning in the RPD, doing a lat long, uh, meaning maybe a, a technician actually uh, installs it on a, on a, on a telephone pole. And that actually plots it on the map. Yes. Plots it on the map. It has the ID Mac address of that RPD and the lat long. So it maps it, it puts it on the map. Uh, and it automatically registers it, and it does everything automated. You know, so you don't have to worry about you know, yes. someone calling in an IP address or a MAC address or whatever. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It could be a mess, right? And then Very the, cool. the uh, and then the uh, the last the last slides just talk about you know this stuff is real. It's open open spec. Uh, it's not Cisco proprietary. So you basically can interop between a, any CMTS core that's part of OpenRPD and any RPD that's part of OpenRPD. So it could be uh, a Harmonic, Cisco, Eris. Um, uh, Casa out there with Casa. this? Casa, yeah, Casa. Huawei was doing the distributed CMTS. 
and gain speed is doing what remote remote macfi yeah i think gain speed got bought some by someone didn't they by nokia 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 okay that's right yeah yeah cool all righty so and i think that's i went to pass the top of the hour but i think that was basically it <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Very nice uh, overview. I think our so our RFI devices are, are these in production? Are they being deployed? Are they still on the drawing board? Where are we at with these? Um, the I know the CMTS code that supports the remote Fi uh, has been officially released. Um, the GS seven thousand remote Fi device is orderable now. Uh, I believe it's orderable now. Most people are trialing it now, field trials. I say most people, people that we're working with are field trialing it. Um, we have a 1RU shelf that some people are using. We have the RPD module that plugs into the GS7000. And um, I mean, I think it's, it's going to come down to people making the decision to upgrade their cable plant, which Comcast said they were going to do, right? Um, they went to their board of directors or their you know wall street and said we're going to invest this much money in plant yeah basically their plant upgrade is going to be remote fi yeah that's so they're talking remote fi the, some of the major operators have declared remote fi is going to be it um so and as i said the anga show i'm going to be at in uh, the first week in june and i know RFI, remote fi is going to be one of the major topics there i'm expecting to see some vendors having uh, some demos there. I would expect you guys are going to have a booth there. So, do you know if you'll have a, an RFI demo at your booth? Actually, we will. Uh, Ron Hranick will be there. John Knox will be there doing most of the demos. Um, I think we're also doing an FDX demo. So, we're going to have really? a full duplex. Yeah. We're That's cool. I'd love to see that. Yeah, I think the big thing there would be uh, run upstream and downstream at the same frequency, see how bad it is, turn on the echo cancellation algorithm and then see how the throughput the looks great no feckers good constellations or all that excellent that'll be a cool demo to see along yeah. along with the r5 of course <laughs> of course <laughs> and i think we're probably doing doxis 3.1 upstream as well yeah to but you know doxis 3.1 is so old <laughs> now it's <laughs> but but upstream is still new upstream, upstream. no one's really yes. doing it. Yeah. getting ofdma working well yeah. in the upstream will be exciting yeah yes definitely all right, John, thank you so much for the information. That's a, another good episode. Thanks, everyone, for joining. We will uh, probably, most likely, be back in a month. The dog is still sleeping. <laughs> slept through the whole thing. That, he slept through the whole thing. That is one good, quiet, sleeping <laughs> dog. <laughs> Leave sleeping dogs. Let sleeping dogs yeah. lie. Yes. <laughs> and with that, good night. <laughs> yes. All right. Good, good dog. Good dog. <laughs> All right. All right, we'll talk to you later. Take, Take care, care, John. Adios. We'll see ya.